Today's video about finger mark is proudly brought to you by week three of lockdown. Welcome back to the channel guys. Today's video is all about finger mark. Now these are also known as spotted scale sea perch, golden snapper, goldies, finger mark brim, or John's brim, but if you go to the Latin, they are Lujanus Johnny. These are in the tropical snapper family, so that also includes fish like mangrove jack, Kubera snapper, Maori sea perch, red emperor, and the likes of those type of fish. They get the name finger mark from the large conspicuous blotch on the rear section of their body. This is often associated with juvenile fish, but contrary to popular belief, it's still present in adults. Even fish up to 10 kilos still get this, although it's not nearly as prominent. This fades quickly after death, and then they turn that beautiful orange, golden, coppery color that you see normally in the photos. Speaking of photos, if you actually want to get a good photo with a finger mark, get it as soon as possible because the scales on these fish come off so easily. If you leave it bouncing around in the esky for half an hour between spots, half the scales will fall off and it won't look nearly as beautiful as it did when you first captured it. The distribution range for the finger mark extends from Eastern Africa through Madagascar, Mauritius, all the way up to the Southern parts of Japan in the North. And then it goes down through the Indo-Pacific regions all the way out to Fiji and then down into Australia. Normally something you associate with dirty coastal water in Australia, you can get them in the Northern parts, Northern Territory and Western Australia. On the East Coast, I've actually shot one in Brisbane, four and a half kilos, and I've heard of people shooting them at Tweed Heads, which is just over the border into New South Wales. So they extend a fair way down on the East Coast. On the Western Coast, however, from what I've heard and talked to with other friends, because I've never actually dived Western Australia, that you start getting them north of Exmouth because the structure and the habitat area that they live in and breed in isn't really present further down, even though it's on the same latitude as where you'd get them on the East Coast of Australia. As juveniles, they are found in estuaries and mangrove type environments. Then the adults move to inshore reefs, offshore reefs, wrecks and pinnacles. Typically when you're looking for them in onshore areas, you'll be in dirty water and you'll encounter fish in that schooling range of about two to five kilograms. This school of fish here is about one to two kilograms and I'm not interested in shooting any of them, but they were pretty cool to see moseying around these inshore reef areas. It was unusually clear, so it made for some great footage. The areas that you find finger mark will often hold barramundi as well. So if you want to target a barramundi, make sure you keep your eyes out for those as well because they will typically hang in the same areas. On this particular dive here, I'm in about eight meters of water and there's a whole school of curious little finger mark all around one to two kilograms. I wait, show a bit of patience and often the larger fish from the back of the school will come closer to you once the other smaller fish feel less threatened by you. This was the standout fish in the shoal and just under four kilograms. Small tides and favorable weather conditions will ultimately lead to better visibility. So it's up to you in your area to study the tides, study the weather and see what makes the inshore visibility good enough so you can actually go out and hunt a finger mark. Now, Inshore areas, like other northern species, black dew, barramundi, mangrove jack, they love man-made structure. If you have a jetty near you that's actually legal to dive, so you, a lot of these places you have to check that it's legal to actually spearfish under them, but if you can find one, often they will have finger mark on them as well.
When you head offshore looking for these fish, your best friend is the sounder. Often they hang quite a fair way off the bottom, so you can spot them on the sounder way before you dive in the water. Trying to shoot them from a bomb dive isn't the easiest method, and it would have been far easier if I would have just got to the bottom and had a look around. This particular trip, I had really bad sinus issues, I had a really bad cold, and I was looking for largemouth nanagai. When you're looking for those fish, you ignore everything else because that's the prize that you're looking for. Looked around, couldn't see any largemouth nanagai, so I decided to take this finger mark of about four kilograms. That there is the perfect shot on a finger mark because they fight really hard on the bottom. You'll notice this fish on the surface is really buoyant and you'll notice a few other fish in this video like that as well. Finger marks suffer really badly from barotrauma, which is injury sustained from a sudden change in pressure. For fish, this basically means that when they come out of the depths, their swim bladder expands, this forces it out of their mouth along with their stomach and they suffer fatal injuries. Did you notice that the fish from the jetty that was in really shallow water, fought really hard all the way to the surface. It was only in about five meters of water. No barotrauma. A fisheries research project out of Darwin in the Northern Territory concluded that finger mark taken out of water deeper than 10 meters show signs of barotrauma when they are released back down. They put them in a cage and caught them out of, I think it was 10 meters of water and they were swimming around. They couldn't control their buoyancy or anything like that. It makes them really susceptible to being eaten by sharks. When they're captured out of water deeper than say 20 meters, pretty much no chance of survival if you release them back in there, which is one of the reasons that spearfishing is the most sustainable method when practiced correctly. Even if you line fish these finger mark and then release them, they're going to die if you catch them out of water deeper than eight meters. So they're not suitable for catch and release at all. Back to the offshore areas, like most fish, finger mark absolutely love hanging out on wrecks. Once again on this wreck, we were looking for largemouth nanagai. No dice on the largemouth, so I decided to take this three kilogram finger mark, a nice eating size. You really don't want to take marginal shots when you're spearfishing on wrecks. You want to be sure of your shot because if you shoot really badly, it's gonna tangle you straight up in that wreck and it's gonna be quite dangerous to be able to retrieve it. This next wreck is one of the first times I had ever encountered finger mark in my life. It was actually on my stag do in 2013. Having not encountered them before, I dive down on this wreck and the whole thing is just covered in finger mark. What do I do? Don't get to the bottom at all. I just see the biggest fish that looks like a standout fish, a darker color than the others. That usually indicates the fish is a bit older and bigger. And I take a shot on this fish and it happened to be quite a good one. This wreck was covered with all sorts of rope and you can see here even a fish that was stoned out, right? Still got into a bit of rope somehow. You really want to be sure of your shots when spearfishing around wrecks. You can also see the signs of barotrauma on this fish when it comes to the surface because this wreck was in about 25 meters. That was the first drop on the wreck and generally like all wrecks, the first dive is going to be the easiest to catch the fish on it. Subsequent dives, a little bit more difficult. You have to spend a little bit more time down on the bottom, coercing the fish back. This dive here, it was Tim's turn next and he got right to the bottom and the school came in close after he relaxed and let them get used to his presence. This next wreck was also on my stag do, one of the first times I'd ever encountered finger mark in my life. And I did the worst thing again, dropped straight on the top, didn't get to the bottom, didn't look through the fish at all. And then I saw one off on the sand line a little bit and I thought that must be a bigger fish, it's hanging out a bit wider. So I decided to pursue that one. Lucky for me, this fish was far enough away from the wreck that with my poor shot, it couldn't get back inside the wreck because it would have tangled me up really, really badly. Bryson, on the other hand, wasn't so lucky with his fish. It got stuck right inside the wreck. It took about three or four dives to get it out between us, I think. Although his fish was 10 kilos, so it was, it was definitely worth it. 
This next spot was quite exceptional in the fact that we had 25 meters visibility. It was a pinnacle that came up out of 35 meters on the sand all the way to about 29, 28 meters on the top. When we drove over it, we could see on the sounder that these fish were stacked on the top. They were sitting high off the top of this pinnacle, maybe even around to 25, 20 meters. They were really high. So when we jumped in, we could see them clearly from the surface. Tim and I both dived together on this spot to maximize our chances of both getting a fish. Tim shot first, and obviously that's going to spook the rest of the fish. I had to chase after my fish, and I managed to put a long shot in and secure an eight kilogram fish. As I mentioned at the start of this video, you can still see this conspicuous blotch on the back of the fish, the finger mark, even in larger adult fish like this. Even just five minutes after expiring, the spot starts to fade. We did a few more drops on this spot and got two fish each around that eight to nine kilogram mark. I've actually done a video on this on my channel a very long time ago, I think maybe two or three years ago. So you, you can check that out here if you wanna see the full story of that day. I really rate finger mark as a table fish, particularly around that three to four kilogram mark. The fillets that come off them are absolutely beautiful. I tend to cut all the red sections out of the meat because I just don't really like the flavor of that. When they get a bit larger, six or seven kilos plus, they can get a little bit more tough. However, I found some fish not tough in eight kilo range, but it just depends on the fish that you get, how well you look after it. When you do get these fish, they're a little bit tougher. They don't taste bad, they're just a little bit more chewy. I tend to put them in stir fries, sweet and sour sauce type things. You can substitute a sweet and sour pork recipe for the fish, really good. You can also put them on bamboo skewers, make a little shish kebab, do them on the barbecue, very nice to eat. That's all I got for you on this video, guys. Thank you very much for watching. I hope it provided just, just a little bit of relief from your self-isolation. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you aren't already, and just remember, the fish are only going to get bigger and less intelligent the longer that this goes on. So that's, that's one positive. There's not a lot of positives, but that's one. I will see you on the next one. What? Even the government's got my teleport device on lockdown.